Hello, everyone. I am here with the Joseph Scott Morgan, uh, death investigator, associate professor, best selling author, podcast host of Body Bags. I mean, those are just a few things in your long resume. Would you introduce us a little bit more about what you do? And and uh, and you also appear on Crime Stories. Uh, you're on Nancy Grace quite a few times a week as well. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I am generally two to three days a week. Some people might hear me. I'm the one she's always screaming at calling. Uh, she calls me Joe Scott in her thick Southern accent. Of course, I can't talk too much. I, I have a thick Southern accent, but I'm also the one that infam infamously is told, uh, she tells our producer, Jackie, to cut his mic because I'll argue with her. Uh, but she's a sweetheart. She's been very kind to me. I also appear on HLN pretty regularly. Um, what else? Uh, I do long crime with Dan Abrams. I'm on there three times a week. Uh, and then every Wednesday night, you can see me on court TV with, uh, with my buddy, Vinny Politan. We do a, a special there about unsolved cases, missing people. Um, and then on top of that, I'm the distinguished scholar of applied forensics at Jacksonville state university in Alabama, not Florida. We're about 90 miles. If, Folks are familiar with with our area. We're about 90 miles due west, 95 miles due west of Atlanta on the I-20 corridor. And so um, love it here. Um, you know, I've been in academia now in for two decades. And <clears throat> prior to that, um, I started out as a forensic investigator with the Jefferson Parish Coroner's Office in New Orleans. Uh, I was uh, um, identified at that point in time as um, uh, the youngest medical legal death investigator in the country. I had no business doing what I was doing, but I started out <clears throat> shuffling bodies in and out of the morgue, uh, and eventually I became a coroner investigator, um, and uh, um, then I was offered the position of senior investigator with the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office in Atlanta and occupied that slot for about 14 years, I guess. And then after that, I entered academia and uh, just been loving life since then. And my, my actual area that I study, uh, I'm a graduate level forensic scientist. Um, my kind of the area, you know, if you're in academia, you know, you have yeah. to study something. So I study the U.S. coroner system okay. and that's what I do. And it's kind of a, it's like an, it's kind of like a, an astronomer uh, watching a dying sun, you know, uh, there, it's an amalgam. You hear this particularly with Tammy Daybell, which we're going to mention tonight. Uh, they talk about the differences between coroner systems and medical examiner systems uh, her body was exhumed, of course, by a medical examiner system in Utah, which they have a fine state medical examiner in in uh, in Utah that covers statewide. And then up in Idaho, they still have county coroners, and many of them are very fine. I, I know the coroner in, in Ada County quite well. Uh, that's Boise for those that that don't know, and right. she's she's a fine fine coroner. So you can't can't judge all corners by the actions of of one you know it's it's like anything else in life you know right and to clarify tammy although she died in idaho she was exhumed in utah which is where she was buried which is why right. you brought up that and kay valla woodcock is here with us tonight and she said hello from lake charles louisiana so she's hey come on say bye <laughs> well we're excited that you are adding to your resume uh guest at hidden true crime to discuss this case with us that we care so much about. Um, you know, Kay, we're grateful you're here with us tonight. And I think Kay to has been on Nancy's show with me, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Very possibly, very possibly. We hope yep. that would make sense. And we hope that, yep. you know, we'll be able to talk a little bit about her. Grandson God bless you, Kay. Tonight. God bless your yeah. husband. Yeah. 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 So we're, we're all grateful you're here and we're grateful. Yeah. Kay and Larry are often, here with us talking. So thank you for being here and, and helping us process this. And, you know, you're, you are an expert we haven't talked to. I was so excited to listen to your episode on Tammy Daybell on Body Bags. That's your podcast. And it, it's it's something that we all discuss here in the true crime community. The, and, and we have not had any answers until you came along. So again, thank you. And, you know, I, I think we have so many questions that have come in for you, but why don't we start with um, 
let's start with Tammy because we do mm-hmm. not have Tammy's autopsy back. The public doesn't. Right. But according to your podcast episode, there are a lot of clues we can look into. But can we start first off with um, how it was handled? She was a 49-year-old woman mm-hmm. who died early, unexpectedly, and no autopsy was done. Can I ask you about right. that? Is that okay? Sure, sure. Feel free. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> What's up with that? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, from Jump Street, uh, let me take you back. First off, um, I was I first became involved uh, with with this. I don't know this universe uh, uh, on in media um, when uh, and I think the 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 a producer with Nancy show had contacted me. And like I said, I appear on her show, uh, Crime Stories, pretty regularly. And they said, we need you to review this. You're not going to believe this. And I was like, well, okay, I've seen a thing or two. You know, you, what have you got? You know, what's going to shock me? I walked away. I was shocked. And so um, I covered it first with Nancy show and then uh, finally covered it. Uh, it. I don't mean to be disrespectful. JJ uh, and Tylee, God rest their souls, um, on HLN and on, uh, on Court TV. Uh, quite extensively at that point in time uh myself and um i think i sent you some clips but myself and ashley banfield at the time had done some of the first uh digging as far as you know forensics go and um i was the first thing i saw was prior to their bodies being exhumed on the property and we didn't really know what we were looking at because we had that aerial drone footage and i'm just kind of recollecting you know what happened because it, it seems like it was just yesterday but it's been a while you know and um and so you know when i when i saw what i saw i saw one the first iteration of the image and you could clearly see a fire ring and this is before anybody else had identified it and then i saw that the logs had been moved and i, I got an idea at that point in time what the crime scene processors were up to at that point and i recognized some of the people out there, not individually as people, but kind of the way they were handling things. I kind of recognize that uh, more than likely the feds were involved in at that point in time. They had called upon those resources and turned out that they had, but at any rate, um, that was chilling enough. And it was, it was hard, hard to make it through that. Uh, You know, uh, I'm not ashamed to say I I wept uh, after, you know, a lot of stuff that I'd read and I'd heard, because I heard a lot of stuff that to a certain degree hadn't been stated, you know, publicly, certainly at that time. And it impacted me. I mean, it, it truly did. And you're not supposed to allow that to do do that to you. But when I began to hear about some of the things that were leaking out that happened, it was it was chilling. It chilled me to the bone. And then Tammy's uh, case came up. And for me, when I began to hear the details, I'm thinking, you know, how can we have three you know, in such close geographic proximity um, that are suddenly going to fall over dead or be found dead or be found under these horrible circumstances. Um, And of course, being the jaded, cynical old death investigator that I am, I I knew that that just was highly improbable. And so my focus kind of shifted from uh, JJ entirely at that point in time, because I wasn't getting any more information. I began to listen to some of the stuff I was hearing about what had happened that morning with Tammy. Mm-hmm. And some of my red flags began to go up. And namely, I think probably what grabbed my attention first in this kind of, uh, and I, I don't remember the sourcing on it, but what some of the information that had come on to us at that point in time was that you had this young woman and, you know, by my standards, she's a young woman. Uh, she's 49. Um, health, healthy, uh, to beat the band, you know, and they said marathon. I think she was training for like a 5K, which still is, you know, if you've got a if you've got a cardiac condition, which keep in mind, number one killer in America is heart disease. You got a cardiac condition, you're not gonna be able to train for a 5K. It's just not right. something you're gonna be short of breath and all those sorts of things. And there was no there was no histrionics with that that would give us any indication that she had some kind of natural disease pathology going on. And then I began to hear what some things began to kind of bubble up at that point in time about what what had been seen at the scene or what 
had not been seen. And that's what kind of stopped me in my tracks. Um, first off, I'd heard that the coroner, the elected coroner, uh, is Fremont, Fremont County, I think. Um, and still, I have yet to be able to completely verify this, but it, I was told at that point in time that that individual chose not to attend the scene. Huh. And when I hear that, and I've got a 49-year-old woman, and I'm thinking back to my own practice, and I'd like to be able to confirm this. I hope that she did attend. But if that is the case, anytime you have a death, you have to contextualize that death. You can't you can't just take a body, uh, particularly if you have the opportunity to see the body in its pristine condition, mm -hmm. um, in the environment in which that person indwelled in life, because there's just think about the world that we live in. OK, the world that we inhabit in our own individual homes, they're very specific to us and the life that we lead, our drugs, uh, our habits. I don't mean drugs in a bad sense, but our medications are there, you know, right. um, toppled furniture those sorts of things, little weird things that we look for, that we're attuned to. Um, and if you miss that opportunity, you can't go back. There's one chance. You can only, and I've said this in body bags, you can only, and I don't know that I necessarily did a good job of it, but you can only cross that threshold onto into that scene for the first time once. You can't do it again. Right. Okay. And that's in its pristine condition. And that's what that's that's the underlying thread here. So you combine that with the fact that and the next bit of information that came in, you've got a deputy sheriff or deputy sheriffs that were out at the scene and they they made the statement that everything appeared to be consistent with an actual death. And I'm thinking, well, where where are you getting that verbiage? Because that's that's something that the medical legal community normally states, you know, mm -hmm. police will say there's no signs of forced entry to struggle. But when you start making uh, proclamations like, well, everything's consistent with a natural death. Well, do you even know what in the hell you're saying when you say that? Because if you're saying that it's natural, it's consistent with a natural death, there's multiple bits of data that you have to have. First off, what is the natural death? Well, it's as a result of a natural biological process. Okay. So, do you have evidence of any kind, like we've already mentioned, do you have evidence of hypertension, diabetes? Mm -hmm. Do you have evidence that this person may have had COPD, uh, congestive heart failure? Had they previously had a stroke? Were they on blood thinners? A myriad of things that you look for that can kind of, that goes into the calculus of determining that this is in fact a natural death. Well, trust me, I love cops. I still teach at the academy. Every year, multiple times a year, I have yet to meet a deputy sheriff that is qualified to make a determination if something is consistent with a natural death, particularly not, with a 49-year-old. That's not their training. That's not their training. No, it's that's not. It's not. Yeah, uh, they they throw, uh, the media likes to throw out big words many times. They'll say, well, it's not their bailiwick, you know, and I had to look that <laughs> up, you know, it's not their bailiwick. So, yeah, it's not their bailiwick. That's my bailiwick. That's, that's what I do. That's and why we have you. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, listen, just so folks understand, I'm not a forensic pathologist. I'm uh, if you're a medical legal death investigator, you are the eyes and the ears of the forensic pathologist in the field. Contrary to what you see on television, forensic pathologists don't go to scenes. They don't. There's not enough of them. There's less than 600 board certified forensic. There's more neurosurgeons in this nation than there are board certified forensic pathologists. There's not enough. And then so you you can imagine how many are employed in places like Chicago and Detroit and L.A. and New York. So you you don't have access. These little bergs don't have access to a board certified forensic pathologist. So <clears throat> and even in Atlanta and New Orleans, where I worked, we didn't you know, uh, I worked the Buckhead massacre many years ago. Um, you know, we had 16 people that were shot dead. We had a forensic pathologist that showed up out there. I've had multiple scenes where we've had multiple deaths. You might get one to come out at that point in time, but they're they're back at the office, either going to court, reading reports, or doing autopsies. That's their bailiwick. That's their job. We bring information into them. So um, the next bit of information that came into me was that one of the children, and I believe it was a daughter, 
Emma had made the Emma comment Daybell. that Emma Daybell. that was physically at the scene, and I need people to listen to this very, very carefully because this is one of the things that made lights and sirens go off for me. We are listening, all ears. <laughs> it came to me that one of these individual children, I think it was a daughter, made the comment that they observed a frothy edematous cone, what I would describe this way, but froth coming out of the nose and the mouth. Well, for us in medical legal death investigation, if you see a frothy edematous cone, and I, listen, I tell my students at Jacksonville State, don't believe anything I say, assume I'm lying, you go look it up for yourself. Uh, this frothy edematous cone, and Liz has put up their pink foam, she's absolutely right. Imagine the head of a beer, you know, you pour it too fast, it gets this kind of frothy uh, top to it. It presents from the nose and the mouth. Many times that is indicative of some kind of congestive failure, some kind of respiratory failure that's going on. Well, what causes that? Well, it arises from multiple, multiple areas. Uh, we see it a lot, uh, for instance, with uh, drug ODs. You see it with like heroin overdoses, all right? It, a heroin impacts the lungs so that they become very, very heavy and edematous and the person's struggling to breathe and this is, those sorts of things. You see it with, in car accidents, when people have flail chest, which means multiple rib fractures and they'll get this kind of pink froth that comes out of their nose. Uh, you see it in drownings and that's that's something mm. uh, that is is kind of striking, you know, when you, you see that because you'll pull a body out of a body of water. I started my career in New Orleans, so I spent a lot of time around the Mississippi River, Lake Pontchartrain, and even down the Gulf. You pull a body that's been submerged, and even if the body's decomposed, sometimes you'll pull the body out of the water, throw them up on their back, and you will actually see this cone begin to present, and that's evidence of drowning lots of times. We look for other things like water in the inner ear, that sort of thing. Then we come to asphyxial deaths. You'll see this in hangings. Okay. Uh, you'll see it in strangulations. You'll see it in suffocations, smotherings, those sorts of things. You'll again, it's you're occluding the airway to a great degree so that the individual is struggling to breathe and their lungs become edematous. And so you have to look for those things. And if you have a medical legal person at the scene, and they see a 49-year-old woman that doesn't have a history of congestive heart failure, uh, is not known to have some kind of drug abuse problem, bells and whistles should be going off in your head. Thank you. And that's I agree. That's something, that's something that you would want to be looking for. And so you have to scientifically validate that. That's that's like doing an experiment. You know, you see, you see a presentation in the lab. Well, how am I going to go back and scientifically verify this? Well, for us in forensics, it's very simple. You do an autopsy. And so when, when we observe this, the first thing that we're going to look for are signs of some kind of traumatic event. Now, um, one of the sons famously said, I think it was in the 48 hour interview that, and I, <laughs> I don't know how, I don't know how, he came up with this terminology, but he was asked specifically about, well, they asked him, I mean, I'll go ahead. I'm sure everybody here knows this already, but you know, they, of course, the kids said that they haven't seen the autopsy report. Nobody has. Okay. And all this is speculation at best, but he did say that the, uh, that the police had told him that this is him saying this, not me that the police had stated that this was a death as a result of asphyxia. Right. Well, first off, when I hear someone say asphyxia, I don't automatically think, which he goes on to further state, that this just means they stop breathing. That's not what that means. If you just stop breathing in medical parlance, that means you're in respiratory failure. All right. Do you Not have any idea, case. by the way, this is the stuff we have been wondering so long. Keep going. Thank you. We are <laughs> US to be US, our full attention. Hang on. I've got to get, I've got to get more coffee. Hang on. Okay. Um, you get more so. coffee. And yes. We all remember it was Garth so. that said that. Yes. Or, or actually maybe I'm wrong. It might've been Mark. Excuse me if I'm wrong, but yes, one of the sons. Uh, you can, I'm sure you can go back and review the tape with 48 yes. hours. It's there. And it's certainly in a transcript. I think I read it before I was speaking to you guys. So 
with that said, um, uh, Robin is asking, hang on one second. I get distracted. Uh, does, yes, pink, sir. Does, does the pink froth, I got my little brace in front of me, uh, had you thinking poisoning, smothering, or something else? Uh, one other thing I forgot to mention relative to pink froth, pink froth can also be associated with cyanide and it can be associated with carbon monoxide asphyxiation that you see. We see it a lot with people that have carbon monoxide, like, you know, the person gassing themselves in their garage and that sort of thing. That doesn't mean that that's what happened. I'm just saying that's a presentation. Um, so wow. he, he extrapolates apparently this child that he says, well, asphyxia can mean that you just stop breathing. And I'm, that's my own editorial there. Go back and verify for yourself. That's not what it means in, in our parlance. When somebody says asphyxia, automatically, automatically, uh, I don't think, I don't think they just had respiratory failure. Okay. I don't think that they have COPD and this led to a fatal event. I think that they choked on something. They were choked. They were strangled. They were asphyxiated. They were smothered. Well, asphyxiated, I'm saying again, they were smothered. Uh, those sorts of things. That comes to mind. And if that is the case, then this brings us back to the presence or lack thereof of a medical legal personnel at the scene. Okay. Because let's just say, for instance, that there was um, a smothering. All right. And people say, well, smothering is the perfect, the perfect way to um, bring about death. It's undetectable. You know, well, we, we can pick up on certain things that you look for. And one of the things I'd want to see as a medical legal death investigator is, uh, first off, I'd want to examine who was in the room with her and take a look at their hands. Um, I'd want to examine if everybody right now will take your tongue and run it along your gum line where your, your lip attaches to your upper gum. And you also okay. have one on the bottom. It's referred to as the frenulum. When you have an event um, where someone is smothered, let's pretend this is a nose right here, and you smother them, you, you're covering over their mouth and their, their nose at the same time, you're going to fight. One of the things you want to look for at the scene, you lift the gum up and you look in here to see if the frenulum, uh, either one of them, have been lacerated or torn. I don't know if that was done. I don't know if anybody observed that. And of course, you know, our old friend petechiae, you want to look for those. You know, you see petechiae on the gums, you see it in the eyes. And if you do an autopsy, sometimes you can see petechiae on the surface of the lungs. You can also see it in the organs of the neck, you know, the soft tissues, those sorts of things. And to my knowledge, this wasn't done. So, okay, so we've missed out on the scene at this point. So jumping ahead, what has happened now, according to what had come into us at the time, was that... Uh, well, first off, it's being said that um, protestations at the scene over autopsies. Don't want an autopsy. Don't want an autopsy. And you've got all these media reports that are coming out where they're saying, well, the family said that they didn't want an autopsy. That ain't their bailiwick. Thank you. Right. That, that falls within the authority of the coroner. And I want to be very clear on that. The coroner makes the determination as to whether or not an autopsy is going to be done. Now, I don't know what the connection is um, between, you know, families and all that sort of thing up there, you know, in, in Fremont County. I don't know who knows who. I'm not interested. All right. That's not mm -hmm. my area. That's down the hall and to the left. <laughs> but for me, for me, I would want more answers than what has been offered up at this point as to why a decision was made not to do an autopsy. And okay, let's just let's just throw this out there because there's another level to this when you begin to think about postmortem examinations. It's not necessarily uh, autopsies are not your only option. We do what's perform. We do what is recall, what is called an external examination. I've gone to many funeral homes over the course of my career, and have examined bodies in the embalming suite. Okay, every funeral home has one. It's where you go. Your loved ones are embalmed there. It's a big kind of 
the old timey ones were these old porcelain tables and we can get in and I want to touch on this to kind of explain what the ME down in Utah was faced with, but we can go there as the local medical legal authority and examine the body. Well, what does that mean? Well, first off, I'm going to put my gloves on. I'm going to have my camera with me. I'm going to take images of the body, clothed and unclothed. I'm going to do a thorough examination. I'm going to look in the mouth. I'm going to look in the eyes. I'm going to look in the ears. I'm going to palpate the skull, run my hand through it, see if it comes up with blood, if there's any knots on the head. I'm going to examine the neck. I'm going to see if there's any discoloration, any markings. I, I want to know if there's any kind of bruising or anything on the chest. Now, I don't, at this point, I don't even know how Tammy was dressed. Was she dressed? Was she nude? Was she wearing a nightgown? Was it, uh, yeah. was it a, a mama's, you know, flannel gown? Uh, I, I don't know what she had on. I have no idea. No one has any idea. And that's important because I want to know the status of the clothing. Was it disrupted? Was it, was it torn? Was there evidence of blood on it? Any kind of unidentified fluid? All right. Well, the other thing that we can do at the funeral home and this is not, it's kind of invasive. It's not really invasive though, not like an autopsy. Um, we carry a kit with us uh, from the coroner's office, medical examiner's office. And it is a blood draw kit. Now it's different than what nurses carry. If I've got any nurses listening out there, you're some of my favorite people. God bless you. You do, um, you have nurses here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I spent a lot of time in emergency rooms. Um, over the years examining bodies. Nurses are my favorite. I, I like them. I prefer them over physicians. They do the, they do the heavy lifting. And that's where you get your good information from. Anyway, um, we take what's referred to, and I, I, again, I urge everybody, this is a learning process. That's what I do on body bags. I talk about forensics and yeah. I talk about the science behind it. Do this, look up 10 gauge needle like 10 gauge shotgun, 10 gauge needle. And you'll see the size of the needle I'm talking about. It's very big, it's very robust. We have it on a very large syringe. And what we do is externally, if you will go on your left side and find what's referred to as your sternoclavicular notch, it's right here where your sternum joins into your clavicle. Go down the left side, two ribs, okay? And this meaty area in between like your second, third rib, that's called an intercostal space. If you've ever injured one of these working out, the muscle in there is very painful. Generally you get it doing the ribs, but you have this intercostal space. And we insert a needle through here and, and we listen for what's called a pop. It pops when it goes into the aorta and that's the big arching vessel that comes off of the heart and it's generally infused with blood. We gently pull back on the needle and guess what? We get, um, a huge volume of blood externally that way. Okay. Then we go and we take another needle, a clean one, and we go into the roof of the bladder. And I'm not going to demonstrate this one, but you know, you go down to the pubic area to the pubis and you go in through the roof of the bladder, insert the needle and you can draw off urine. You don't have to open the body up or anything like this. Then we go into the eyes and we draw vitreous fluid. All right. Now, what have I done? Well, at the at the funeral home, prior to them embalming the body, that's important, prior to them embalming the body, I've examined the body externally, I've taken mm -hmm. photographs, I've made note of the clothing, I've made detailed notes of the physical findings at the, at the mortuary, mm -hmm. and I've drawn fluid. And guess what I'm gonna do with the fluid? When I go back to the ME's office or back to the coroner's office, I'm gonna submit it to the state crime lab, and they're gonna run it they're gonna run what's referred to as a standard panel. Now, when we do standard panels, we look for everything. And it's when I say standard, that's what it means. We look for the basic things, cannabinoids, opiates, benzodiazepine, cocaine metabolite. Um, we're gonna look for salicylates even, you know, acetaminophen. We'll look for all these basic things that people are known to take. Right. And then we retain some of this. We don't use it all. Because if we retain it and we keep it, then if we don't get answers there, then we can run it for what are referred to, some people refer, I like to use this term, exotics, things that you don't normally think of, like poisons and that sort of thing. People are the asking, problem, people are here asking a lot about poisons. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, as well they should uh, in a case like this, because you don't have any answers. And right. all we can do right now is speculate. Um, 
And at this point now, once and I'm I'm out of my fantasy world, and we're talking about what happened to Tammy. Uh, there was some some information that had come in at that point that the coroner may have gone to the funeral home. But to the best of my knowledge, no talk samples were drawn. Now, as a, I've heard a lot of people say that the coroner is a part-time position. Okay. That's what okay. they say. Okay. Follow my logic very carefully. I'm following it. Yes. Governments, governments can, local governments can come up with after school programs and build playgrounds and stuff for the aged and all of this stuff that they do. But when it comes to the dead, it's a part-time position. And I want everybody that's in the sound of my voice right now, I sound like a televangelist, everybody that's in the sound of my voice right now, if you're listening to this, I want you, as painful as it is, think back to the loss of a loved one. Think back yeah, and how painful that was and how important that was to you. Now, I, as a medical legal death investigation formally, I dealt with these people day in and day out. All these people that you never see, you never hear about, and everybody sits around in quiet desperation, you know, like the old the old uh, 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 writings uh, from years and years ago. Uh, and we deal with grief in various ways. But one of the most disrespecting things that happens in our world is that the the dead do not get their due, and the the families of the dead don't get their due. Because you can push money to all kinds of things, but we don't want to hear about the dead. So when they say things, I find it very insulting. And this has been written over and over again. I, I, again, I tell you to go look it up yourself. The coroner's part-time position. So you're telling me that because it's part-time position, this is a good enough excuse for you not to go and examine the body of a 49-year-old woman mm -hmm. that has been found dead, essentially, um, and to draw toxicology. You're telling me they don't cover your mileage. They don't give you a vehicle. They don't give you some syringes to draw something. They certainly give you the authority to have the body sent to Ada County, which folks don't understand. Ada County is where all of the autopsies in Fremont County are done. It's several hours away. So they have to put them in either a hearse or transport van and take them. Because and again, that's Boise for anyone wondering. That's, that's Boise. Where I used to be a TV reporter there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And guess guess whose bodies did go to Ada? JJ and Tylee's. Okay. JJ and Tylee's. That's where they were examined. But for some reason, Tammy's death wasn't important enough. And for me, this is this case in and of itself is seminal in this entire universe that is the Daybell Vallow saga. Because you're talking about something involving truly an intimate relationship between this man, the accused, and we'll call him the accused because he sure as hell is accused now. He's about to go to trial. He, he was in proximity to her. He was last with her. She Wait. died. She was found dead. And that's, that's one of the kind of benchmarks that we use in medical legal death investigation. And just because, um, you know, just because you're sleeping in the bed with somebody and you wake up and they are deceased, I still qualify that as a medical legal death investigator as a found death. It's not going to cost me anything to put the keys in the ignition, drive to that location, and examine the body. Right. Cost me nothing. Cost me nothing at all. But if I don't do that, it costs me everything. And in this case, which you've got people dead from here to kingdom come, it, it could mean everything in this particular case because you had a body that was pristine. No disrespect meant relative to these precious little angels that were murdered but their bodies had been buried. Their bodies had been buried in clandestine graves, not Tammy's. Tammy was dead in her bed. That's a pristine environment. That, that is what we would refer to as an evidence-rich environment. And that train left the station, sister. And it's never going to return. Because on that day, that afternoon, whenever it was, 
that mortician put Tammy's body on that mortuary table and started embalming her. And what that means is that every bit of blood in her body was extricated at that point in time, and she was infused with embalming fluid. And so there's a reason they embalm bodies. Well, it's a chemical bath that the body is infused with, and the body will last forever and ever. I've, I've done multiple exhumations over the years where I've been involved. I've, I've had cases, um, you know, uh, I, I think one of the, uh, the, one of the most grand that I ever participated in was an African-American gentleman that had been a, a pastor. <clears throat> and he had been embalmed 16 years before. And he was in, if you can imagine this, he was in an all white suit. He had a white shirt, white tie. And if you're LDS, I've seen uh, sealers that are dressed yeah. this way. I don't know. White tie, white shirt, white suit, white vest, white belt, patent leather white shoes, and red socks. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. He had a carnation on his lapel. Carnation was the only thing that was out of sorts and withered. He was perfectly intact. But when I say perfectly intact, he was preserved. Mm -hmm. I could not, we could not actually go in and appreciate anything that had been going on at, um, at a chemical level prior to death, which we refer to as anti-mortem, because his body had gone through this change. It, it was essentially preserved. I mean, like you would do a lab specimen at that point in time. And so in order to get her body from Idaho down to Utah, mm -hmm. um, the body, in my experience at least, I don't know about Idaho and Utah, but I'm assuming that it's the same way. In order to get a body across state lines, it has to be involved. You're not going to be able to transport oh, a body without it being involved. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's still the case. There, at some point in time, there was a federal leg regulation. You know, we had done, there was multiple cases I've been involved, involved with where people were, for religious reasons, they, they protested relative to, uh, um, um, uh, religious reasons that they didn't want the body embalmed. Of course, I've had people protest for autopsies as well, and that didn't stop us because it just shouldn't, because this is the way we always looked at it. And again, we're very cynical people in, in my line of work. Um, the family that protests right now that they don't want an autopsy six months from now, they're the ones that are going to be suing you because you didn't do an autopsy. I'd rather, I'd rather endure the wrath in the immediate and let everybody get on with the squalling, as my granny would say, and gnashing the teeth and all that stuff up front and just say, look, this is the way it's going to be. You know, you're given this authority for a reason and you're going to say that there, there has to be an autopsy. So now she's transported right. down there. They, they dig a hole in the ground. I'm assuming they put a crypt in the ground, which is that you'll see them going down the road. If people are not familiar with this, there's a big concrete box. I think people, there's a lot of people that think that they just stick coffins in the ground. That's not what happens. There's a big concrete box that the casket is actually lowered into. And then they put a cap on the, in most places, they'll put a cap on top of that crypt and then they cover it with dirt. Okay. And yeah, it's, it's six feet down. The bottom of it is at six feet. The trick is how well there's, there's a couple of factors. How well was the body embalmed? How well is this casket sealed? Um, Cause as, as arid as, uh, as, uh, as Utah is, they get rain, you get snow and if, if, is the casket sealed to the point and is that crypt sealed enough so that you're not going to have water rising up into there and it's going to impact the body inside of the casket. Um, and also if the body is not thoroughly embalmed, then any tissue that you have there that they didn't do a thorough job on is going to be greatly decomposed. The rest of the body will be preserved, but let's say that some of the fluid didn't make it in a particular area, then that area is going to be compromised. Okay. And people say, well, Morgan, you know, what are you worried about? There's not going to be any insects in there. No, that's not the truth. You have something that are called coffin flies and they can burrow down. They can smell dead uh, and you'll find them in the, in the caskets many times. So when you go to the funeral home and 
they they tell you, you know, that we're going to sell you this twenty thousand dollar casket, and I'm, you know, made out of titanium or whatever it is. <laughs> you'll be pre- you'll be preserved for the next, you right? Know, yeah, through through ever and ever through the nuclear war, you'll be preserved. <laughs> Uh, spend spend that money on your kin folks while they're alive. Just do yourself that favor. Uh, but at Great any advice. rate, the the when there's always these other factors that come in, you know, that are going to impact the body. So by the time uh, the metaphorical trigger is pulled and they decide to do an exhumation, which in and of itself, again, this is no small feat. You you can't. You just don't run out to the graveyard with a backhoe and a shovel and say, I'm going to dig up this body. That's not what happens. You have okay. to go get a court order for this. And many times judges will deny this. Uh, and this goes to a broader broader piece for me because they were able to get this exhumation very quickly. Exactly. And I've seen this thing. This this will be fought many times in courts. You know, people say we don't, you know, or they'll have to argue it multiple times before a judge. I've seen them denied before. And the rumor in this was, case, with, and the rumor yeah, was with Tammy was that oh, a, a sister-in-law started this rumor that Chad might have been involved, and people kind of denied that. Oh, anyone can get a body exhumed, but you're telling us that that's that's not true. That it takes effort to get a court order. Yeah. Yes, it does. It does, and I we're not. Think you're a rock star that you're drinking coffee right now, so I agree. <laughs> we're we're not. Well, thank you. Uh, my wife, uh, she makes me drink out of my Santa Claus cup every year this time of year. So, uh, um, the uh, the um, when when you think about the exhumation, the exhumation can only be suggested in Idaho. They can only come to them with their hat in their hand and say, please, will you please exhume the body? They don't have to adhere to that because now that body is under the control of the state of Utah. And anybody that gets um, that gets exhumed, brought up out of the ground, uh, that's going to have to, that order will have to issue forth from some jurisdiction in Idaho. I mean, in Utah. And I don't know who that was. I don't know how that happened. I don't have any of those details. We don't, we're, we're, Again, we're back to speculating. We don't have a lot. All we can do is just kind of put the pieces together and compare it to known cases that, you know, things that have happened in the past that, you know, we look for these pitfalls along the way that, you know, where we sit back and say, I probably wouldn't do that if I were you. I'd go down this road. Uh, but it would take an order that the state of Utah would would uh, recognize a lawful order and maybe my assumption is way off. I can't imagine that, you know, that a, um, a judge in Idaho could issue an exhumation order in the state of Utah. That would have to be something that uh, a magistrate or justice of peace or a judge, a district judge would have to order. You know, you'd have to go before the judge and say, you know, your honor, we're and there's a submission. You can probably go into Utah, into the Utah statutes. And there's process like there is in everything in law. What does it require for an exhumation? It's an order of exhumation. This thing would have to be written up. You've got attorneys that are involved and all that sort of thing. And I would imagine to the, I would imagine because we've got so many hands on this thing from a legal standpoint, a law enforcement standpoint, that some prosecutor somewhere got in the ear of another prosecutor and said, uh, listen, this is something that, uh, that we need to look at. Uh, would the frenulum damage possibly still be present? Yes, it would be. You could appreciate it if it was preserved. Um, you could still appreciate the little laceration uh, or lacerations. If this is even the case, I don't know that it is. I'm just saying that this is one of the things we look for. And to the best of my knowledge, it wasn't looked for, at least not. Uh, let's see, JSM, could a toxicology panel be done post embalming? No. Uh, it cannot, it would, that, what you're going to have to do or what the ME would have to do is look at tissue samples and microscopically, there are certain things that they can pick up on. Many times though, that will apply to ongoing, let's say exposure to some kind of substance like ongoing where you got morphologic changes in soft tissues, that sort of thing. That doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to be, if this is an acute event where, um, Tammy would have been subjected to some kind of agent. Uh, I don't know what that would be. Um, 
I don't know that there would be any kind of uh, uh, gross evidence of that or even microscopic evidence that they would, that the pathologist, because, you know, the, when the pathologist is, when they're done doing the actual autopsy, you know, where you see them in the suite and we're opening yeah. the body and that sort of thing, that's not the end of the autopsy because then you have to do the histology examination, which is the reason we take organs out of the body is um, we take the organs out, we weigh them, and then you take the body and you, you take the organs and you put them on a board and you further examine them and you dissect each organ. And out of each organ, you take a little sample and it goes into, if any of you guys have ever seen a, um, a bait bucket, like you get worms in. Yeah. Um, I know that sounds weird, but we do, we put together uh, uh, a little uh, tissue bucket and you put individual slices of each organ and they're high, they're very recognizable. Like lung tissue looks different than brain tissue and heart, the myocardium looks different than liver tissue. And so, and then we slice them and put them on a slide and then you look at them microscopically. And sometimes these diagnoses will come down to a histological diagnosis. And that's going to be key here because you're going to be absent toxicology. Okay. So the, the answer is going to be in the tissue. Now, it can be in the tissue microscopically. But keep in mind, Tammy's body was not autopsied initially. So right. let's just let's just play. Let's don't say Tammy. Let's just say any 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 suspicious death that's not autopsy. I'm not talking about Tammy Daybell. Uh, let's say that we suspect that there's trauma in the neck. Okay. Now at this point, but yet the body has been embalmed and buried. Because we haven't uh, seen her autopsy results, so we're just don't know. Speculate don't know. on somebody. Okay. Yeah. So I've got um, I've got person A that I've had exhumed. Um, we take them into into the autopsy room. We begin the autopsy. Um, the soft tissues here, uh, we have these kind of muscles that run through here. They're called strap muscles. And uh, they're kind of interlaced over over the area of the trachea, you know, where our windpipe is, larynx, and all these little organs. They're called organs of the neck. Um, you can still see little focal areas of hemorrhage. So let's go to Gabby Petito real quick because I, talk, I talked about this case a lot. And you notice in that case, the coroner came out very, very quickly. And the coroner did something odd in that case that's not normally done. I, I, I love this guy. He came out okay. and he said, this is the cause of death. We're waiting on the manor. Generally, it happens. It'll happen in another manner. He came out and said, and you could have knocked everybody over in my world with a feather when he said, this is, this is throttling. He didn't say asphyxia. He said, throttling and throttling is very specific and what he saw yeah. and he gave a great I, I urge anybody that goes back I think was his name Dr. Blue I think that was his name um, if you go back and see the interview that he gives he says uh, one of the reporters says uh, well doctor how'd you come up with that determination what what, what what's the indication that this was uh, a throttling case how do, you, how do you tell that And he says because we're humans we have opposable thumbs what he meant by that mm. is that yeah. Her neck was enveloped like this. And my point is, is if you have our person A that we exhume and we look at these soft tissues, those little focal areas of hemorrhage will probably still be there in the muscle. Okay. That that's that that means that that bruising that has taken place, there's a high probability that you could still pick up on that. And then if you have any structural damage, say for instance, if you'll feel like with guys, you know, we have a prominent Adam's apple right here. And then above it, the infamous hyoid bone that, yeah, uh, thank you, Carrie. You're absolutely right. You have superior to that. You have the infamous, uh, our famous hyoid bone, which is the only bone in the in the human body that's not, that doesn't articulate with another a bone. It's, its sole purpose is to anchor the tongue in the back of the throat. That's all it does. And it's kind of shaped like a bird. It's wing shaped. And the only time you ever see that thing fractured is in a manual strangulation. Okay. So that would still be there. It's, you know, embalming doesn't eradicate fractures. You're still going to see that. And then, you know, I was talking about the Adam's apple. This is all uh, cartilage. These are cartilaginous uh, uh, 
uh, uh, bodies in here. So cartilage, you know, we have cartilage in our nose, we have cartilage. Did you know that cartilage can actually fracture as well? And again, embalming doesn't make that disappear. So if you've got these little areas, that, that can present as well. Also something else that I have seen present in exhumed bodies are petechiae. You can still see them in the surfaces, soft tissue surrounding the eye and even on what's referred to as the scleral surfaces of the eyes themselves, that can be appreciated. The only, the, the problem with, with, uh, um, with embalmed bodies is that um, if, if any of you guys have ever seen old images, you know, we're getting into, we're getting into uh, Christmas season now. So everybody's going to watch a Christmas Carol and the old Christmas right. Carol. Uh, they, I think it was Marley. Uh, you know, he's walking around with his chains and that sort of thing. There's actually one movie where he still got coins over his eyes and they used to do that. And they say, you know, they would give him coins in order to pass over the river sticks. That's not the case. The reason they put coins over eyes is because the eyes sink and they, they considered that to be, um, ghastly. That's another reason that when people are embalmed, this is another problem that comes up with embalming. Um, the lips, right? Well, first off, there's a wire that is punched through the teeth here and here, and it's twisted and it jaw shuts. If you ever see Christmas Carol, one of the things that they'll do is in that, Jacob Marley, his head is tied with a bow or with a handkerchief. The reason they used to do that is because the jaw would open and you get what's called permanent O sound or O appearance like that. And the dead will do that. So the morticians disrupt the body when they do this. And sometimes you can disrupt evidence there by wiring the teeth together to keep the mouth closed. They put glue on the lips, shut them down. And they'll also put cups, they're these little white cups that fit inside of the eyes, almost like a gigantic contact lens. And that keeps the, it gives the eyes form so that when you go for a viewing and everybody says, oh, they look so nice, that the eyes are, are covered with those little cups and then they seal the eyes with glue as well. So all of this cosmetic stuff has been done to a body like this. So, you know, that's something else that's in play here when we do exhumations and trying to determine what happens. These refer to as postmortem artifacts. In this case, it would be uh, artifacts as a result of uh, mortuary process or, or uh, embalming. Interesting. So what would they be able to tell going back to Tammy, and I know none of us know Tammy's mm -hmm. autopsy results. You don't know. I don't know. Nope. But going, what would they be able to discover from an embalmed body? As you say, she was pristine and that, that was missed. It, it could have answered so many questions. It wasn't answered, but what could we know? Clearly the strangulation, it sounds like some broken bones. What else could be seen in an embalmed body? Well, you're only going to see evidence of in an embalmed body. Um, if there is a strangulation, you might see focal areas of hemorrhage here uh, with Gabby Petito and, for, and she was not embalmed when they examined her. Right. The reason I was talking about throttling True. and the reason it stands out so much is that, let's see, I have a cord around here somewhere. Um, with a, um, if we use, say for instance, a ligature, uh, I'm sorry, forgive me. If we use a ligature, people think about ligatures and hanging and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Ligature strangulation. See how thin that is? Well, when this is wrapped around a neck, it leaves a very thin uh, furrow. Thin furrow. Wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it leaves a very thin furrow, and you'll have a very tight area of hemorrhage. When you have a throttling, look at the surface of my hands, okay? This is going to be dispersed because energy is being transferred from my hands as I clamp down or somebody, not me, if somebody clamps down on the surface of a neck, like Gabby's, Gabby's case. So you'll have diffuse hemorrhage through here and all of the soft tissues. It won't be focally located. That's assuming, that's assuming that this was the method that was employed. Remember, go back to what the son said. And if somebody in the audience could verify who that was that actually said that, I'd love to know which one of those uh, kids, uh, whoever it was, I don't know what, what name it was. Anyway, um, that's assuming that that's the case. Now, if you have a smothering, um, where you use a hand or a pillow 
Mm -hmm. You're not going to have this kind of hemorrhage. That's why it's important to look at the frenulum. That's why it's also important to look and see if there's trauma to the nose. Uh, some pe sometimes people will bite their tongue. Sometimes people will bite their lip. It's a tremendous amount of force that's involved in this. Um, if it is a, a suffocation where um, an individual takes, for instance, a plastic bag and puts it over their head, um, that's something that's very difficult to pick up on. And this right. is this is one other thing that, that you see at with people that are in uh, respiratory distress as it relates to a, an asphyxial death. Um, their head, they'll become what's referred to as cyanotic. And I don't know how many of you guys out in the audience uh, dig eggplant. I like eggplant. Okay. I love eggplant. <laughs> okay. Eggplant Parmesan. Exactly. Well, the next time you see it, exactly. next time you see an eggplant, uh, take a look at the color of the eggplant, and that's the color of someone's head uh, after they have been suffocated. If you have a bag that's placed overhead, and there's, and I urge anybody that Ugh. that's uh, interested in death investigation, there's a uh, there's actually a book. It's been out there for years and years, and it has to do with assisted suicide. And there's actually an organization called Hemlock Society. Um, that wrote a book and some of you guys probably heard it. I can't believe somebody hasn't done a true crime show about this yet. It's a million dollar idea. I have to keep that in mind. Okay. Um, I'm listening. Called, yeah. Called, called final exit. And there's actually a book out there that gives people instructions. It's written by a guy named Derek Humphrey, who famously was famously assisted his wife in taking her own life. He did it by poisoning, but he went forward and suggested ways that people could do this. And it's kind of ghastly when you think about it, but I've actually worked final exit cases where um, I'm not going to tell you specifically how it's done, but uh, utilization of a plastic bag is one of the methodologies that's employed. And so there's any number of ways that you can arrive at this. And again, this goes back to the initial premise here. Where did this kid get the term asphyxia? Because I don't know about you guys, um, but right. my kids don't walk around. Uh, talking about asphyxia. That's something that's in my vernacular. Now, they may have heard me talk about it because they, they've seen me on TV or something like this at some point in time. But it's not something that people commonly say. And the fact that he used the term specifically as he used the term asphyxia right. um, really gives me pause. He didn't say that mama stopped breathing. He didn't say that mama was in respiratory right. distress. He said asphyxia. Asphyxia goes, that's an, that's an action word, okay? That's an action word because, you know, you, you talk about someone that is being asphyxiated. That doesn't mean that mama stopped breathing. Well, yeah, the, the result is she stops breathing. But how do you arrive at that point logically? When you begin to apply logic and scientific process to this, what has initiated her to have stopped breathing? It's right. like these these people that'll sign death certificates and they'll say, um, well, they died of cardiac arrest. Everybody dies of cardiac arrest. That doesn't tell me anything. What brought them to that point? You can have your head cut off and your heart will arrest. OK, mm -hmm. uh, so it's very nonspecific. But this kid used the term asphyxia. So that for me really Thank you, Carrie. Garth said Ellie told him Tammy died of asphyxia. So where did Garth get this from? I think that's the million dollar question right now. I'd, I'd love to know what the genesis of that comment is. You know, kind of what, where did that bubble up from? But I can tell you this, come January 9th, we're going to have some answers one way or another, because we're all, I don't know about you guys. I've been um, I'm so glad you guys asked me to come talk about this because I could talk about it for days because it's something I've been scratching my head over because I, I can't believe <laughs> in all of my years of investigating deaths, both as a practitioner and now covering stuff in the media since, I don't know, for quite a number of years now, I've never come across anything like this. Never, ever, ever have I really? come across ever. anything like this. And I keep, you know, I keep waiting every week. I keep waiting for another body to turn up, you know, or somebody else is dead, you know, some kind of thing that happens, you know, where you find out, you know, I, I thought that I'd seen and heard it all, uh, you know, when the information came forward about, uh, God bless them, those two little angels. Uh, right. But, you know, I, 
it just the it just keeps on coming, you know. And I, I just I can't Im- imagine that. So what January 9th, What you think we're going to have answers January 9th? I don't know. We're gonna they're gonna set the tone. I think with his trial, I think it. Uh, am I right? It does start January the ninth, correct? They are putting it off. They are uh, next year, not this year, but the following. So. Oh really? Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. We're all waiting, and most likely, then the autopsy is going to be. We won't hear about the autopsy until the trial starts, right? You're never going to hear about it. And that goes to a bigger point for me as well. And I, I wanted to address this. Um, people have commonly or have continually speculated on why is it that um, uh, why is it that that we're not getting any more information? One of the reasons is this. This isn't just like uh, the authorities in little old Fremont County, Idaho are handling this. You've got bodies from here to kingdom come, and you've got all kinds of nefarious activity that are going on. That are going on. You've got you've got you've got things that are going on like fraud uh, that involve, you know, people being defrauded and all kinds of stuff that we can't even see. Things that we might not even be attuned to yet. So you've got multiple jurisdictions that want a shot at this, including the feds. Mm-hmm. Where was Tylee last seen? Right. She was seen. She was seen on federal property. So once once you engage okay. in that, now you brought brought forth the full weight and resources of the feds. Don't think for a second that the federal prosecutor that handles that area out there in that district doesn't, you know, have a have a. Uh, it, the, trust me, they have the they have the local prosecutor's home phone number. They've been talking uh, because there's all kinds of stuff. And then, you know, these two run off to uh, Florida. They run off to to Hawaii as well. You know, so I don't I don't. And again, we still don't understand the full depth of that event. You know, all those things that come into place. You've got people crossing state lines. You've got these deaths, these suspicious deaths down in down in Arizona. Right. I think. Um, we want to ask Charles. you about Alex and well, there's Charles yeah, Alex and, and then Charles. we want to yeah. ask about Alex. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Fire away. <laughs> okay. Well, you talk about pristine deaths. I thought that was a very interesting term. Thank you for teaching me that Alex was one of those pristine deaths. We thought we, we all thought, okay, we're going to have some answers here. They're going to learn how mm-hmm. he died. And then that autopsy came back, pulmonary embolism, mm-hmm. natural cause. So I have a couple of questions. This is a question that has been burning in me though for almost two years now. Could I respect the finding of pulmonary embolism, but could the pulmonary embolism have been caused by something else that happened to the body that made it not a natural death? Yeah, I suppose. Um, you know, the I think his autopsy, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was done in Maricopa County by the ME uh, for Maricopa County. I'm not, I can't remember. And uh, again, um, much like the ME in the state of Utah, um, um, you know, that, that um, it's fine organization. You know, they're very thorough. You've got board certified forensic pathologists that would have been, uh, been attuned to this. Um, and so when, when they're seeing these PEs, uh, you're going to see a presentation. And what happens is with pulmonary emboli, you'll open up the lungs. And when I say open up the lungs, you remove the lungs. And forgive me for being so graphic, but you know, it's just that's the nature of that. Right. We're talking about death investigation. Right. You dissect each one of the lungs and you go down the pulmonary tree. Okay. So you're opening along the area through which oxygen is delivered or air is delivered. And then you get off, it kind of branches out like this and you'll see these little storms in there, these little focal areas of hemorrhage that are in there and they begin to occlude the airway. Now, what's the genesis of pulmonary emboli? Well, um, it can happen as a result of trauma many times. 
uh, you can have somebody who will throw a pulmonary embolus. Uh, how many of you guys have ever heard somebody uh, throw in a PE that's been, truck drivers get them sometimes. You'll have individuals that uh, uh, are flying for a protracted period of time. Uh, you can have, that are, they're already uh, compromised physically in some way most of the time. Sometimes you can have them drug related. Uh, I remember when I first heard this, I, I began kind of searching through the literature and trying to determine if there's some kind of agent out there that could be applied um, that would tie back that you would have a result of a PE. I've had this question asked as well uh, uh, about air being injected. Um, I, I don't know that air being injected is going to create a pulmonary embolism where you're actually going to see, and I've heard people put that forward. I've never worked a case of that, okay? And I've had people say that. You see it as a device on television where they go in and they inject air into somebody's IV line and that sort of thing. I'm not saying it can't happen, but how would you deliver that to him without leaving a mark or having a struggle on board? Um, I would imagine that at some point in time, this will be more closely examined by multitude of people I think that, you know, uh, it is a strange coincidence, though, that he falls over the least. Dead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. And it's a very specific cause of death. This is not something that is, um, again, like, at least they didn't say he died of cardiac arrest. Okay, because we, we actually have something to hang our hat on. The question is, um, is, is there enough evidence to call, uh, you know, to, to, to call a forensic pathologist in and say, okay, are you sure that this is what you saw? Trust me, they saved the tissues on this case. And let me tell you what else happened. Uh, this happens at most medical examiner's office, they, offices. When you, um, and hospitals will do this too. For anybody that works in a hospital, uh, if you've, uh, if you're around doctors, they do record reviews. And what they'll do is they'll it, um, they'll gather in a big room where they make a diagnosis and they'll pass the records around and they'll look at them. Well, at medical examiner's offices, I would imagine in Maricopa County, it's the same way. Um, you'll probably have a staff of, I don't know how many board certified forensic pathologists they have. They have several though. It's a big place. I think Phoenix is like the fifth largest city in the nation. They have a high volume of cases. So they have to have all hands on deck to be able to do these autopsies. They'll probably have like a morning morning meeting, then they have a record review. And when it comes to a case like this, they'll pass this around to all of the board certified forensic pathologists, including the chief ME, who will review these records. And they'll say, you know, how did you arrive at this diagnosis? And they'll say, well, I found this here, 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 and here. These are the pr procedures that I went through. And not only this, when we took when we took histological samples, remember I talked about how they section section the tissue. They use a particular kind of stain in order to make this kind of rise up visually, so that they can see it microscopically. They'll take photos of that. There's cameras that are hooked to microscopes now that can seize those images in that moment. The question is, how exactly did they arrive at the diagnosis? of PE um, mm -hmm. from what was the mechanism that brought them to that point? Did he just spontaneously throw a PE? And right. so if so, why did he? And what, going further back in time, what kind of medical history did this fellow have that would have predisposed him to suffering an ME, I mean a PE? Mm -hmm. um, and well, is there I'm any evidence? That, yeah, is there, is there anything that you can scientifically hang your hat on. And I would assume that after this vetting process, um, they, they felt comfortable with it because now, now it's not just the ME that has reviewed this case now, because so many eyes are on this to say other lead. people that are in the, that are in authority, they would have, there's a high probability that maybe a prosecutor came to them and said, you know what? We respect you guys, but we want to make sure that we have covered all of the bases here. As a matter of fact, we're going to have a, we want a pulmonary specialist to take a look at this. 
at this diagnosis, this postmortem diagnosis that you that you've determined. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I uh, I think that that that's something that that would have been done, particularly now since the this is so intense right now. Um, you know, moving forward because again, you know, you're back to the Tammy Daybell situation where you don't want to miss anything. And uh, they're going to they're going to flip over every rock that they possibly can in this case. Thank you for sharing that. Um, that is a question. Everybody is everybody's mind. And just, so you know, we have nine hundred and fifty people listening to this. Everyone has so many questions. Can, um, can I ask you about the children? A little bit. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. So a trigger warning for everyone. I'm going to be asking him uh, about JJ um, right now for anyone that's really hard to listen to. But uh, I would love your thoughts. I know you've talked about this. Uh, I believe it was on Court TV where I heard a segment with you discussing JJ Vallow and the way he was found. That's another autopsy that we haven't seen. And if and if K is still here, uh, you know. I'm just, Okay, just a warning for you, and I'm I'm so sorry. Um, and and Kay might have the autopsy results. I, I'm not sure, but what were your thoughts in in how JJ was found? He was in duct tape. There were plastic bags, one over his head. What else do we know about the way he was found? I think I think from a topographical standpoint, he was not a great distance, but he was a distance away, um, from Tylee. Yes. And that's, that's, in, that's important. I think in this context, uh, I don't know, again, I'm not privy to know what kind of trauma he may have sustained. I think that what's very interesting to me and still, you know, begs, begs a certain question. Uh, and again, it's something that's disturbing to me is that, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, a lot yep. of times things will run together in my mind because I cover so many cases, but uh, um, thinking back to this, if I remember correctly, the last time JJ was seen was with Alex and he was walking him you know, through the house or something like that. Right. He was in his PJs. That was the last time and, he seen. And for anyone, I did post something about that today, how he was seen, JJ was seen being carried back in by David Warwick and Melanie Gibb. The, that was the last time he was seen on Alex's shoulder. Correct. Sorry. Right. And you compare and contrast that with what had been stated relative to JJ's behavior earlier, where there were people that had made comments about him crawling on cabinets and knocking things over uh, that JJ had at one point in time been medicated, that he was not medicated at this point. And, and how, how exactly was he in this state of, uh, of, of sleep and how deep was that sleep mm -hmm. and what could have, brought that about. I think that that's, that's my biggest question because that's the last time we see him. He exits off of the stage and is never seen again, um, you know, until, you know, until his mortal remains are recovered. And so that, and it's, it's a huge contrast to what happened with Tylee. Right. These are two separate um, I'm not going to say they're separate events, but it would, I would suppose that they are. It is the nature of them though. And I'm not a profiler, but the nature of them, just if, if I was out on the scene handling this and I looked at these two precious children and I would see how they were treated in death, the contrast is overwhelming. I can say, uh, so my husband does uh, profile and he is a forensic psychologist and he would agree with you that we've discussed, we don't discuss this than the cause of death, but he does discuss mm -hmm. how from his research and understanding how different their bodies were found, that their causes of death and what happened to them were different, which is yeah. I think what you're trying to express. It, it is. And with, with 
JJ, it would, it would, uh, at least I would opine that he was treated with a, a, a level of, of respect uh, that was not afforded to Tylee. Uh, yeah. That he was, um, you know, we, uh, again, going back to Gabby Petito's case, uh, and these cases are not the same, but there's, there's something that we talked about. We talked about a lot with her, it's memorialization of a body. And you look for this kind of thing when you're talking about um, how perpetrators treat individuals when they kill them, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, the care that they take, and you can kind of read a lot into it. And certainly, people uh, with a lot more letters after their name than 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 I uh, can read more into this. But um, when you begin to look at this and you see the care that was taken the kind of cocooning, and that's the way I like to refer to it. Um, that takes time. It takes an individual to be present in the moment, to be prepared, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that you didn't see with uh, Tylee. Um, right. uh, she's, that's a frenzied, more of a frenzied, uncontrolled, um, disorganized event. JJ, it wasn't. At least that's what we're hearing, what has come to us with the wrapping that was done and all of this sort of thing. And right. again, you know, like I would know. angry with Tylee perhaps too, you know, angry at her or something. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there was, uh, with Tylee, if I can be so bold, I would say there was almost a desecration with her because you've got, um, you've got a, allegedly a, a at least a partial dismemberment event. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got uh, uh, an attempt at least to uh, to destroy the body with fire. Um, and then you've got this this mysterious bucket uh, that was found melted uh, that's kind of found alongside her, if I remember correctly, that's in this this kind of grave. And also the area where her body is found says a lot. Um, you know, any of us that live in rural areas, you know, we we might have a, a fire ring out back of our home, but, you know, and when you see the nature of the ring itself, you know, it looks like an area uh, where uh, where people would gather and somebody breaks out a guitar and you're, you know, you're singing songs and you're around a bonfire and all that. But for all I know, they're burning trash out there too. I do know this. I do know that they had allegedly used an area to discard dead animals. And when you're commingling <clears throat> the body of this poor girl out there with animal remains, and you're doing these things to her body, it, it goes to a different level of horror at that, yes. at that moment in time. To me, it does. I think, and I want to get back on track here with the science, there is a uh, uh, there's there's a spot on that property that I'm very interested in. And if you'll look at the aerial photography, uh, there is like a building that's immediately adjacent. Well, it's not immediately adjacent, but it's not too far away from the firing. Is it, is it uh, a barn, do we mean? And I'm think, not as familiar with the yard, but perhaps. I think it's, it is a barn. It seems like it's it's an aluminum-sided or some kind of metallic-sided building that's there with a metal roof. You can see it. Um, and, you know, this is – I'm going to be very blunt with you. Um, when yep. it comes to uh, dismemberment, there are very few people that uh, are deft at it, Okay. Uh, first off, you have to have specific anatomical knowledge in order to facilitate something like this. And it could be very frustrating. I've, again, over the course of my career, I've worked a number of dismemberments. Um, and there's a certain amount of skill that goes into it. Um, in, in my practice, and I've, I've participated in over 7,000 autopsies over the course of my career, um, there have been moments in time where I've had to take off limbs and do all these sorts of things that you guys would just be, you know, mortified over, but it's just part of what we do. We do it in a very controlled environment and, and we have the proper tools in order to facilitate this. 
And we're also doing it by law. So if you're going to attempt to do this, you're not going to do it in plain sight. Now there's a hedgerow, if you look at that, that area, there's a road runs there. I think there's a hedgerow. And then you've got this big open field where the, the fire ring was and all this sort of thing. And then the dry, dry pond area back where uh, little JJ was found. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to attempt, first off, you're not going to attempt to take a child's body and wrap that body and cocoon that body and take that much time. You're going to have to do it in a, a secured, obscured area where you feel comfortable, perhaps a workshop, perhaps a barn where your tools are. Mm -hmm. You know, let's kick it up another level. If you're going to engage in behavior um, such as that, that we think is evidenced um, in Tylee's body, that's not something you're going to do in plain view. That's something that you're going to need to be in a controlled environment in where you have access to instruments in order to facilitate it. My whole point with this is this. If something was done inside of that barn, which I don't know if it was, I'm just saying it seems my convenient. It's right there. There would be a plethora of physical evidence that would be found in there. I would imagine that every single instrumentality um, was taken, was removed from there. That is a handheld held tool, whether it's a hacksaw, skill saw, carpenter saw, axes, machetes, whatever it is that they've got in there. And forgive me, I, I don't mean to put anybody off, but that's the reality of this. All of that would be taken. And also all of the surfaces in that environment would have to be examined. This is not this is not an affair that you enter into where um, you're not going to leave something behind. And I want everybody to keep this in mind. This is um, this is uh, actually uh, there's fasc there's a fascinating guy in forensic science, and he's he's uh, he's kind of our godfather, if you will. You know, everybody has kind of their the place where their font of knowledge comes from in a particular scientific practice. And ours is a guy named Edmond Lacard, and he lived well in excess over 100 years ago. And he established the first uh, crime lab in Lyon, France. And his, many of you guys have heard this term, but he, he came up with something that's called Lacard's extreme Exchange Principle. And just to kind of break it down and synthesize it, what Lacard states is that, just listen to what I'm saying, open up your ears just for a second. Yeah. He says that every contact leaves a trace. And you take that principle from over 100 years ago, and you can still apply it today. It's a matter of fact, it's amplified, it's magnified now in the world in which we live when it comes to things like touch DNA, trace evidence, all those things that Edmond didn't have access to and could not have anticipated. It even applies to computer science, computer forensics now. Um, and it's quite amazing when you but you have to be careful enough in order to recognize the application of Lacard's principle. And in this case, this is a striking example of of what you would be looking for in an environment, a contained environment like that. I don't know that anything happened. For all I know, whatever happened to Tali may have happened out in that field. But if I'm if I'm trying to think, not get into the mind of somebody that would do this, but if I'm trying to analyze this environment, the first place I'm going to is that shed or barn or whatever that place is. I don't know. It just caught my eye. It's, it's convenient because this is a, a frenzied event. If what they're saying about her is accurate, and again, you have to couch it with that because you cannot assume anything. This is a disorganized event. It would have been something that would have been rushed. It would have been yep. something that uh, people would have wanted to, they would, the person that is doing this because they've never done it before, I, I would think, uh, would find it abhorrent, something they didn't want to be in place of because it's one thing to say you're going to do it, but when you get into the middle of it, when you get into the middle of it, People get very reckless and they suddenly get very uh, frustrated by the process. First off, they don't know okay. anything about human anatomy. This guy can write all the 
religious tracts that he wants to, and he can pontificate about all that stuff that he wants to. But uh, I don't know how much, if allegedly it is him uh, or one of his accomplices or somebody right. in his sphere, um, I don't know that you've got an anatomist among them that would understand how they would not understand the architecture of the human form. So it's something that would get very, very frustrating. Uh, we go back to, and I want everybody to listen to this very carefully. Uh, I'm going to take you back to another case that I just finished covering on yep. law and crime. And I didn't, I didn't think this damn thing was ever going to end. As a matter of fact, if I had, if I hear the name Robert Durst one more time, I'm going to go screaming into the night. I'm so sick and tired of hearing that case, but I covered it from beginning to end on law and crime day in and day out. One of the things that stuck with me with Durst was that when you saw him interviewed in New Orleans, remember when they hooked him up on charges initially and there he's given that, that confession, you know, there in that room with the prosecutor and everything. And, he begins to talk about the dismemberment of that poor man down in Texas. Um, what was his name? I can't remember now off the top of my head. You would think I would remember. He talked about how uh, he talked about how taking apart a chicken and how he had talked to surgeons who said that you always go to the joint. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you would be right if you were going to try to do an amputation. You're not going to take it off at mid shaft because it's very frustrating. You go to the joint and take it apart like you do a chicken. And he actually described this. Now, Durst completely dismembered this man's body down in, uh, down in, in, uh, uh, down in Texas. And he really did a job on this guy. He took a long time to do this and he had no anatomical understanding, but he disposed of the, of all of the, the parts, of this man's body. As a matter of fact, you know, they were found floating out there uh, in the in the harbor. I don't think that they ever recur recovered this poor man's head, but it took time. It takes patience in order to do something like this. In Tylee's case, this is a frenzied event, if what they're saying is accurate. Uh, and I think that that's something that, that a lot of people are going to be scratching their heads over and they're going to be wondering who put their hands on her, who, who would be Absolutely. sinister enough sinister enough to snuff out this young life and to do this to her. And it goes to, in my estimation, if what they're saying is accurate, it goes to a, a whole nother level of evil that I don't I know many of us can even plumb the depths of. We agree. And, uh, and a question about that. People are talking about Chad being a cemetery sexton. He's still even burying or digging graves would not mean he knew anything about dismembering no. a body or even cremation because that's all done elsewhere so i just want to reiterate yeah that. i mean a lot you know god god bless sextons that. god bless sexton but i mean um uh, you know i don't know maybe you've got a future as a ditch digger or a plumber uh that's essentially what that job would qualify you for now there's a certain skill to be able to lay it out like it has to be laid out and then uh and then uh you know place the crypt in there appropriately so it's going to be positioned because again this goes back to uh, preservation of the remains uh, and the care that you take in your craft when you do this, but that's not going to have anything with, to do with disposal. And if you look, and I urge everybody to go back and look at these images. Guys, it's not like they brought a backhoe out there, and I think there was a backhoe, but it's not like they had to excavate like down six or seven feet to do this. This, this is very, in the whole grand scheme of things, when you're talking about an anthropological recovery uh, the earth, <laughs> you're scratching the surface in what they did in this excavation. If you look at the, if you look at the images, those drone images where the people are standing around the site of recovery where Tally, Tally was, excuse yeah, me, yeah. I've got hiccups, it's drink too okay. much coffee. Uh, I'm having to stay, stay awake. Uh, anyway, <laughs> when you, you look at this, you can see that their, um, their height, their relative height in the images it doesn't change a lot. So they're not going too deeply when they excavated this area. So it's, it's not like, it's not like, you know, you'd mentioned that he's got experience as a sexton. Um, it, it's, it's not like he applied those skills. It's not like right. he, he laid out a form and, 
you know, brought a backhoe in, which is all these, you know, what these guys do now. It's, it's not like, you know, uh, you used to have the old time grave diggers that would go out there and they, they were highly skilled people uh, that would go out with shovels and pickaxes and they would dig these perfect holes in the ground. That's not the case nowadays. Well, especially, you know, uh, if it was frenzied and to keep in mind, everyone, Tammy was still alive at this point. So it's not like they had all the space and time in the world to be able to plan and, and dispose. And so, as you say, frenzied, right. Whether he was a sexton or not, wouldn't um, mean much with this, with this situation. Um, and Colette yeah, just posted and, the pictures you were referring to. So everyone look for Colette Cox's. Uh, 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 this is another thing when you think about it as well. And I've had people ask me about this specifically with the case where you're talking about, because there was an attempt at, um, at, uh, at burning. And um, I urge everybody out there, if you truly like historic true crime, um, I urge everybody that's in the sound of my voice to order a book called Murder in Coweta County. And it's uh, there was a movie that uh, Andy Griffith and Johnny Cash starred in. That You know, for, for my money, I don't know that there's anybody that was ever more ominous on screen than Andy Griffith when he played a bad guy. If you've never I'm seen him play a bad guy... He wow. plays the the ultimate bad guy. This guy's last name is Wallace. This is based on a true story. And it was the, as a matter of fact, historically, it was the first time that the testimony of a black man was used in order to facilitate a capital conviction on a white man. And that white man wound up going to the electric chair and was killed, uh, was executed as a result of this of his crime. But there's a great piece to this story. Um where this fellow that Andy Griffith portrayed in the movie, um, where he had his two hired men uh, go out and try to uh, dispose of a body of a guy that he had beaten to death. And they, they had to do it uh, with fire. And um, I've covered a, a number of cases like this, and I've worked some cases where people try to render bodies down. It's not an easy it's not an easy event. It's very frustrating. It's, it's kind of a, it's, it's at the same level as attempting to dismember. If you've never had, if you have no, uh, okay. anatomical experience, uh -huh. um, uh, getting rid of bodies vis-a-vis -vis fire, is very, very difficult. It's not like, um, like with cremation, you have a contained area and you have a, an ongoing uh, fuel source with natural gas that's applied in a crematory. And again, it takes a protracted period of time. If you're in an open area, you have to have a fire tender, which means you have to have wood uh, and wood that's going to burn at a very high, high rate. Um, and it has to be tended and it can take uh, it can take well in excess if it's constantly tended. Um, I, I refer back to uh, Grim, the Grimstead case in Georgia. If any of you guys, the, the beauty queen that was found in the, in the peach orchard or what remained of her. Um, it takes, you have to tend this fire constantly. So that would have been another level of frustration. How are you going to keep a fire going? Even if it's behind a hedgerow, it's on your property. You're going to have to continue the fuel source on this for hours, maybe even a couple of days to render something down. Whoever did this got very, very frustrated. And again, this goes to the frenzied, unplanned, frenetic thing that was going on here. And they finally just threw their hands up and said, I've, I've had enough of this. I'm digging a hole. And okay. that's, in, in my estimation, that's and probably what happened. Thank you for sharing. Everybody wants your estimation, even though we know that you don't know the results. I we don't. all want your opinions and your speculation and your guesses too. So thank you for sharing that. And so finally, after all of that, they thought, let's just yeah. bury her. Yeah, that, yeah that's, that's precisely, in my estimation, that's what happened because – when you see things like, and again, I still have, again, I'm superimposing my thoughts on this. Why would, why would that, this bucket that, and if somebody can find a reference for that, I know that they found a melted plastic bucket that was commingled into, um, into, uh, into this area, uh, if I remember correctly. And the only thing I can think of is that bucket contains some type of evidence, something that had been collected, potentially blood. I don't know. They wanted to try to get rid of it too, mm -hmm. because why else would you take a, why would, why would somebody take a bucket, a container like this that you would assume that you'd bought for whatever purpose, maybe you're going to 
feed your animals with it, feed your chickens. Maybe you're going to mop the floor. I have no idea what you're going to do with your plastic bucket. Why would you, why would you have it at, at a, a burn site where you're trying to get rid of this precious young girl's body? Why, right. why would it be there? So for me as an investigator, that bucket is something that certainly I'm sure positively uh, would have been collected uh, and rightly so, and would have been very carefully, uh, very carefully examined. Um, and, uh, you know, um, a lot of care would have been taken with it because I think within that there's contained a tremendous amount of evidence. Um, going back to JJ, uh, one of the things that's very compelling to me from a forensic standpoint is that yes. tape. Um, I and want I'm, to go back I'm, to that. Yeah, please. Yeah, I'm fascinated by that um, because he was, JJ's body was memorialized to the point where great care was taken. Well, even if you're wearing gloves, you're going to leave something behind where there's stray hair. But at some point in time, if, you know, we're in the Christmas season right now. And so how many of you guys are wrapping packages at home? Um, I'm a terrible package wrapper. I am horrible at it. I, I really am. Everything comes out uneven. I'm no good at it. It just, you know, it's like I just kind of wad it up and wrap tape around it. When you're yeah, in a problem. position like this, you've got this this tacky surface. I generally keep some tape around here because I do demonstrations on the air. I don't have any right now. But you take the tacky surface of, of uh, tape. Remember, they're using the term. It's not just tape. They're saying duct tape which is very tacky. Um, and so on the tacky side of it, you're leaving behind something that is contained in that ad adhesive, okay? That can be skin cells, it can be hair, it can be what's referred to as a plastic print. Remember right here, this is a forensic lesson, you don't have fingerprints on your fingers. You have friction ridges. Oh. You leave behind fingerprints. Okay, so everything okay. that you touch is a negative image of your of your friction ridges that you leave behind. So, just listen. You're wrapping packages. Think about this. All right, um, you're sitting around. Take a piece of tape, put it on your finger. All right, put it on the pad right here, okay. and you've got fatty lipids. That's how we detect fingerprints, latent prints. Those things. Those are prints that cannot be seen, so we have to dust for them. That sort of thing. But with tape, you can appreciate it. Lay the tape over your finger, all right, like that, and peel it off very slowly. Go to a light, hold it up to a light like this, okay? And if it's like scotch tape, um, it'll luminesce. You can actually, well, it's opaque, so you'll be able to see through it, and you'll be able to pick out the detail on your print. Now, scotch tape is one thing. Duct tape is completely something different. It's, it's scotch tape times two. The, the adhesive right. on that is much stronger. So any anything that it touches, it's going to collect that. Now if you're if you're not remember you're you're doing this burial on your own property. Why do you, why do you want to wear gloves? You think that nobody will ever find it. So you're just gonna grab the tape, wrap tape, pull tape. Maybe you're you know if you're in in like in if you ever go in an emergency room you're around nurses i know any nurses in the office in the in the audience will know what i'm talking about i used to do this in the morgue well as well because i use tape a lot in there you cut the tape and you stick it to your shirt you know you've got strips of tape hanging off of you and you can take it and apply it in different ways so you're cutting these lengths of tape or maybe you're just wrapping the tape like this so you've got the plastic print that's on the adhesive side then let's say for instance you have to touch the back side of the tape well, that's going to be a latent print there. It's not in the adhesive, right. but if they take care, if they take care with that, then you can find print there. And here's the big thing. If this plastic that has been used is done in layers, you might not recover anything from the exterior layer of the, um, of the, of the wrapping. However, if it's folded over, pull that back, that area is protected. I don't care how much dirt yeah. it's under. So when the body is removed, and one of the things that that really bothered me about this, that I actually heard one of the investigators say they pulled it back. 
Mm -hmm. They pulled, they revealed, and he said something about what he saw. I wish they hadn't done that. <laughs> you leave, you have to, you, yet yeah, JJ's body would need to be examined. Okay. Have to be examined. That's for sure. But you want to keep, you want to be able to keep the body again in pristine condition. So you transport the body. You suspect who you have. You transport the body intact and it's pristine as, as pristine as it can be back to Ada, Ada County, right? To Boise. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Nobody else touches it. You got one, one person that's touching this body. Okay. That way the chain of custody is not disrupted and you know, who's putting hands on you have a tech, a crime scene tech, hopefully from Idaho state police that are physically there waiting. You take the body, wrapped in the wrapped in the plastic there in the morgue and you set up a super glue mean a super glue tent and you fume the entire the entirety of this wow. before you ever go any further wow and that way any kind of print that's in prints are very very uh, uh very fragile uh right now um you know we're in, it's winter it's getting toward winter so our skin gets dry and that sort of thing right. you don't have as much oil but the reason we leave prints behind is because we've got our, our skin uh, kind of leaches out uh, fatty lipids, fatty lipids. And that's, that's you know, you, we talk about how oily we are. You see my skin kind of, you know, shining right now. Um, you, we've got fatty lipids here. Uh, your skin is not shining. Uh, I've so, got it. Powder. <laughs> I get powder. So, you know. yeah. so when you touch a surface, I'm actually touching, touching right here, you're going to leave something behind. You're going to leave that print. And the reason you leave it there is because these fatty lipids have exuded from your, the pads of your fingertips. And that's you. So with super gluing, um, you create a tent over, over body, you heat the super glue, it fumes and then it falls. And you see this in all these TV shows, they'll show it or some mock-up of, of something like that. And it falls like this and it rests. And that print is frozen forever and ever. Amen. So you can pick up on whoever's prints are there. And everybody that's involved in this, they've taken exemplars from everybody. I mean, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they had the, you know, they may have found, a, hopefully everybody was wearing gloves out there. Uh, of course, cops have their prints on file, but any right. anybody in in this universe, any suspect would have had their prints taken, and they would compare that. So again, that's one of those little forensic tiebacks that you have. And then we get into things like hair and fiber, and then we get into DNA, and we haven't even talked about DNA. Anything that's sloughed off, and I, I won't you know I won't prattle on about the forensics too long, but just so that you understand that with touch DNA. You can find touch DNA deposited on the surfaces of bags, on bodies, clothing, all that stuff. And it's because, again, we're back to skin. The reason you leave touch DNA behind, it's actually dead skin cells. Jurgen's company has made millions and millions and millions over the years, okay, uh, because of dry skin. Well, we lose skin every day. You don't see it, but you have dead skin cells at that fall off. So when that dead skin cell falls off, you slough them, you have a partial strand of DNA. It's not a complete strand and it falls and you collect it. Trust me, anybody that's involved in this, they would have done a buccal mucosal swab on these individuals mm -hmm. to see if they have, if they think that they recovered unidentified DNA out there at that scene, trust me, they're going to do a match with that. And they're going to try to tie that back uh, relative to what they're finding at the scene. If not, they would have gone somewhere else and recovered DNA. Uh, that they could validate. You can get it from family members. You can do whatever you want to do. They're they're going to put on a full court press relative to all of this. So that's you know that's just what I'm taking away. Incredible. If 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 it were my case and I was I was handling this, um, that's what what I would do. And I would not presume to tell them what to do. But these people are brighter than I am. Trust me. Uh, they you know they're covering all of these bases because you know you, you think about it. There's a lot resting on this. Um, the uh, the reputation of of everybody that is involved in this case and in this investigation, you've got people that are double and triple checking the work of individuals 
all through this. Remember what we talked about already this evening. We talked about multiple jurisdictions involved. We're talking about feds possibly being involved. It would not surprise me if a lot of this evidence hadn't been pushed to DC, to the FBI crime lab or any other kind of resources that they might have. You know, a lot of people have been asking this question. Um, it's an uncomfortable question, but it's one that's on everyone's mind. Is it possible or do you think that JJ could have been buried alive, which is all the duct tape, or do you feel that's more of just a cocoon and taking care of him? I think it's, you know, put your mind at rest. I, I don't think that that's the case. Something, something happened. I have no idea how he came to his end. Um, I hope Thank whatever you. animal did this was merciful. That's yeah. the best that I can hope for and, and say, um, you know, whoever did it, um, and, uh, that it was quick, but no, I don't. And again, that's only my speculation. I guess that's as a daddy, that's, yeah. that's what I hope, um, you know, that that was the case. Yeah. We all hope that too. We all hope that too. Um, we all care about justice for these children. And we, um, as Stephanie Budge said, we're grateful that you've helped us with this educational live in, um, in justice. This is our journey towards justice is what we say on this channel, um, where we cover essentially the Dable case. We've also covered Gabby Petito. And so, um, the information you've provided us, I think there's a lot of questions that you have answered that have been on people's minds for over oh, years almost or almost two years this yeah. month. So yeah, do, do you, do your own research, do your own due diligence. That's what I would suggest to anybody. Um, and, um, many times keep your own counsel. I hear, I've heard all kinds of things, you know, uh, rising up, not so much now as it was early on. Um, the information will begin to come out, I think, um, hopefully. Um, and, and a lot of people will be, uh, providing answers, um, you know, that will, and I, I can tell you, this is going to be, we've already seen media coverage of all of the preliminary hearings. Um, you know, and I covered, I think a couple of Daybell's initial appearances, uh, where everybody was in the little boxes during COVID. I you know, was commenting on some of that stuff. Uh, there wasn't a lot to dig into, you know, but it, it's, it's on the way. It's, uh, it's a train coming down the track towards him. It's a little pin light off in the distance. It's going to grow uh, as time goes by. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone's saying we need to have you back again. Um, sure. Maybe, and you have a busy schedule between your national appearances. Maybe we can snag you for Hidden True Crime again. Um, I love chatting. <laughs> I like educating. So Yeah, yeah you've just... been a great educator. I can tell you're a professor and you have had our attention for so long. I think we know it's late where you are, so um, we'll let you go, but we could have had your, <coughs> excuse me, we could have uh, continued talking to you for another two hours. So I'm going to, I'm going to let you go. Um, but I just want to say thank you. And, and, and I'll, I'll end this live too with everyone, but um, I, I want to say one last thing. So, so a lot of people have been posting the link to, to body bags, podcasts. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Um, Joseph before you. Yeah, actually a very exciting thing. Uh, you're located out West. I, I was, I had the privilege of, uh, being a part of, uh, the, I don't know if anybody got to check it out on, uh, on oxygen, but, uh, it's on, uh, it's on Peacock now murdered and missing in Montana. Um, where we profiled the deaths of three Native American girls. And we're hoping that that's going to expand. Please check that program out. It's something I'm very proud of. We shot it during COVID. These cases are terrifying. Uh, and you'll see that when you when you watch this. And I was, I was the forensics guy on that. And we're hoping that that's going to go, that that'll be picked up and turned into a series because uh, it's amazing what's happening on reservations throughout this country yeah. uh, where no one knows what's happening to these young women. They're disappearing, they're being murdered right. Right. and nobody investigates the deaths. And the cases that we covered were, uh, were quite chilling. I'm very proud of that. Um, so, uh, you know, check that out. Um, a lot of other exciting stuff on the horizon. I'll be glad to come back and talk, but yeah, please check out body bags. It's only once a week. Um, it's uh, iHeart, Spotify, Apple, um, and um, 
we're I'm strictly a forensic show. I don't um, I don't get off in into the weeds with uh, a lot of the other stuff. I like to talk about forensics and all of the cases. I think uh, my latest episode yesterday uh, um, uh, was little Gannon uh, that whose body was found in a suitcase in Florida. You guys remember that case? Yes. In her case, the stepmother's cases, she just appeared two weeks ago. Her case is coming up um, very shortly. We're hoping that that's going to, I'll be interested to see where this goes. This was a horrific case. So every week we're talking about, I think next week I'm going to be talking about the, uh, the uh, Travis, I can't remember his name, the concert, um, the concert uh, uh, crushing in at Astroworld. That's going to be my next episode. And I talked about it last night on live, uh, live Fox. What's it called? Live now Fox or Fox. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. They had me on last night and I talked about uh, compression asphyxia. And so we'll be talking about that case next week. Great. And Dr. John's been on uh, that as well for those wondering about the Gabby Petito case. And that can be found in our media playlist for those wondering. This is great. This is this is wonderful, the work you're doing and the education you're bringing to people. And I'm so excited to hear about uh, the reservation, the missing women on the reservation being investigated. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being a part of that. That's been something that I've been um, very concerned about and aware about. So, so thank you for being a part of that. I hope that does become a series. Um, I hope it does too. Yeah. I, I would like to share one last thing before we go, if, if my moderators could put it up, but the Tammy Douglas Daybell foundation, we spent a lot of time talking about Tammy. This foundation was uh, put together by Tammy's siblings and her parents. They've been very private. They've been very private. They have said that they hope justice is served swiftly and have requested privacy as they mourn their daughter and sister. And they started this foundation uh, to help children learn to read and to create literacy programs across um, the country. It's an incredible legacy for Tammy. And and since we have spent so much time talking about her and we don't know how she died, we can only speculate. We hope it was peaceful. We hope yeah. You know, for many things, but um, if anyone's looking for a, a foundation to donate to this Christmas, um, if anyone can, oh, and Julie Holden also posted Dr. Matthias discussing Gabby, but if anyone can um, share that uh, Tammy Douglas Daybell Foundation link, I think that'd be a wonderful thing to end on. And I'll also put it in the the description of this video. So a lot of, a lot of links I'll add later tonight, but uh, thank you. And to Larry and Kay Woodcock who have been with us tonight, JJ's grandparents who sounded the alarm. uh, We hope you have a very Merry Christmas and we hope you find joy. And uh, we know you're missing your sweet JJ this year and we're with you and we are with you in fighting for justice. And we're so grateful that uh, Joseph Scott Morgan, that you've joined us on this channel to help because we we can see how much you care too. So thank you for being here. God bless and Merry Christmas to everybody. Merry Christmas. We'll see you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.